Our next speaker is uh, Neil Ferguson. Uh, Neil and I go way back. We're part of a very small club of people who try to understand the world by understanding Henry Kissinger. His latest book is The Idealist, which is a totally filled book of great research and insight on Dr. Kissinger. And of course, his other book, which is out there, is The Great Degeneration, How Institutions Decay and Economies Die. And I think that's what Neil is going to be speaking on. He's at Stanford now at the Hoover Institution. Always been a friend of the Institute. Welcome, Neil. Well, if you, uh, if you wanted to define globalism, then perhaps you would come to a, a festival of ideas uh, in Abu Dhabi that's named after a resort in Colorado and hosted uh, in uh, buildings belonging to a university in New York uh, at which a great many people from the United Kingdom give speeches. Uh, <laughs> What I'm going to try and, and do with that context is explain Trump. And uh, that's not an easy thing to do, I find, outside the United States. In fact, it's pretty hard inside the United States, especially if you try and do it in the places where I spend my time, places like Cambridge, Massachusetts, or Stanford, California, or for that matter, Aspen, Colorado. I think one has to ask the question, because it's the question they ask in middle America, is this morning in America again? Morning in America was, of course, the Ronald Reagan re-election campaign ad. Uh, and I think for many people who voted for Donald Trump last year, making America great again is code for going back to the 1980s again. when those voters themselves were younger and uh, better off, and America just seemed greater. If, on the other hand, you live in Cambridge, Massachusetts, or Aspen, Colorado, it's twilight uh, in America, and there, standing next to uh, President Trump, is the Prince of Darkness himself, Steve Bannon. Um, I've spent time talking to Steve Bannon, and I think he has been somewhat misrepresented in the liberal media, uh, but one of his characteristic traits is to enjoy being misrepresented in uh, the liberal media. The question that liberals ask, whether they're in Cambridge or Aspen or Stanford, is are we heading back to the 1930s? Is, is that what Steve Bannon's vision is. And one good way of checking to see if that is a legitimate question is to read one or both of these books. Sinclair Lewis's It Can't Happen Here was published in 1935, and it's an absolutely riveting uh, vision of what would happen if the United States acquired a fascist president. Buzz Windrip is the name of the president in this case. Uh, and there is a rather Steve Bannon-like uh, chief strategist, Lee Sarenson, in the book. Or you can read Philip Roth's more recent plot against America. I think if one reads those books and then looks at what is happening in the United States today, the thesis begins to fall apart that we have somehow entered the death throes of the republic. One of my oldest friends, Andrew Sullivan, takes the view that we're on the brink of American tyranny. He wrote a startling essay in New York Magazine on this theme. Uh, I love Andrew, but I really disagree with him on this. I think, as an historian, the worst category error of our time is to conflate populism with fascism. It's constantly done. Otherwise, intelligent people make casual comparisons between Trump and Hitler, Trump and Mussolini, and I am here to tell you that this is downright wrong and indeed devalues the currency of historical analogy. Why do I think this? 
Strip away, if you can, the noise, the deafening noise of tweet, counter-tweet, hysterical talking heads on CNN, columnists having meltdowns in the New York Times, and ask yourself, what exactly are the core aims of Trump? When one does that, it seems to me that the aims are very unlike those that we would associate with fascism. As I keep trying to remind people, and I have spent a lot of my life studying the interwar period, fascism is a lot about war. It's a lot about making people put on uniforms and invade other countries, as well as overthrowing constitutional orders. Populism is not about that, and here I agree with Gideon wholeheartedly. Populism is a backlash against free trade, free migration, free capital flows, and the social and economic consequences of over-globalization. In that sense, it rather resembles the populism of the 1870s and 1880s in Europe and in the United States. Populists don't really itch to go to war. What they itch to do is to limit globalization, whether it's through tariffs or immigration restrictions. Trump's core aims are twofold. The most important to his voters is surely to boost the economy. The growth rate since the financial crisis has been significantly below its historical trend. And Trump says he's going to double that growth rate. And he says he's not going to do it just through protection. Of more importance, I think, in the Trump economic agenda is, number one, tax reform, and number two, deregulation. I'll come back to these points in a minute. The second really striking feature of populism is that it repudiates the neoconservatism of the uh, Bush years, but also the sort of bungled isolationism of the Obama years. There's a realism at the heart of uh, Trump foreign policy doctrine, uh, a sense that the national interest is really the uh, most important consideration. It's the right of all nations to put their own interests first, he said in his inaugural address, a line straight out of Richard Nixon's playbook. The one thing that Trump wants to do uh, abroad, which I think is uh, striking, is, as he puts it, to eradicate radical Islamic terrorism completely from the face of the earth. Some people are tremendously anxious about this aspect uh, of Trump's uh, strategy. But I find that when I come to this part of the world and talk to people about the problems, uh, not only in the Middle East, uh, but North Africa and further afield, there's an understanding that there needed to be a change from the policies that were being pursued by the previous administration. And that perhaps this will be a significant change for the better. I certainly think so. When you put it like this, the liberal overreaction to Trump's election has really verged on the absurd. Uh, and I really don't want to disparage the Women's March, uh, but I must admit that when I see any group of people led by the likes of Madonna and Linda Sarsour, I have my doubts about the good faith of the organizers, if not those marching. You see, populist anger is perfectly intelligible. And for me, the decisive question back in uh, November was simply this. Do you get what people in middle America are angry about? If one looks at this simple measure of living standards, which is real average household income, you can see that middle America went uh, very swiftly downhill after around 1999 and hasn't yet got back to where it was at the end of the 1990s. This represented a significant break from the historical trend of the post-war era. When you get down to it, the case for, just to pick one particular policy goal, radical tax reform in the United States is absolutely overwhelming and it's bizarre that this was not done in eight years of the Obama presidency, when, just 
take just one example, the United States of all countries has the highest corporate income tax rate uh, in the developed world. And to look at another part of the Trump agenda, the United States economy is being choked by excessively complex regulation. Uh, no president uh, issued more regulations than Barack Obama. Uh, his first term alone set a new record. And I wrote a book, The Great Degeneration, which Walter kindly mentioned, more than four years ago now, saying the reason that the US economy is not performing the way it did in the 1980s is a combination of a completely distortionary fiscal system and hypertrophic regulation. So before we have the heads exploding all over Harvard Yard, as they have done since 3 a.m. on November the 9th, could we just take seriously some of what Donald Trump has said? And could we also take seriously the reasons why so many people in middle America turned out and voted for him, defying all the confident predictions of the liberal elites who thought that he had a 10% chance of becoming president. No, if you went to Princeton, Donald Trump had a 1% probability of being president. Well, if that's an indication of the quality of thought of our liberal elites, you can't really blame people for wanting to try something else. I'm going to spend the next nine minutes telling you what I think the real obstacles are to Trump's presidency being a success. And I've said to my liberal friends for over a year now, your nightmare is not a Trump presidency. Your nightmare is a successful Trump presidency. It is not Madonna who is going to stop Donald Trump succeeding. It may well be Donald Trump. Let's take a very striking feature of the Trump presidency, his unpopularity from the get-go. As you can see uh, in this chart here, no president since polling began has started off with as low approval as Donald J. Trump. And it only got worse in the first four or so weeks uh, of the presidency since his inaugural. This is a meaningful handicap. And it illustrates an important point about populism that Gideon didn't point out. If you've attracted fickle voters from a political establishment, don't expect them to stop being fickle. If Trump doesn't deliver significantly, the voters who turn out for him on November the 8th will turn away from him. So that seems to me a really important obstacle to Trump's success, and we know it matters to him because has any politician, even Tony Blair, talked as much about opinion polls uh, in the course of a campaign? Trump's obsessed with his own approval rating, and this must really hurt. The second major obstacle to Trump's success is actually the Republican Party. And this may strike you as, as paradoxical. Uh, Trump is nominally a Republican president. Unlike other Republican presidents in live, uh, recent memory, he enjoys majorities in both the House and the Senate. But not everyone in the GOP owes loyalty to Donald Trump. And there are some people who have an implacable hatred towards him, including my old friend John McCain. If there was one person I would worry about in Washington, D.C., if I were Donald Trump, it would be John McCain. And that matters given that the numbers uh, of votes in the Senate are not large from a Republican point of view. Only a small number of defections can kill a legislative uh, initiative in the Senate. In order to succeed, Donald Trump needs Paul Ryan, the Speaker of the House, to succeed. And one thing that I've noticed, uh, even in the United States, uh, but especially abroad, is how much people are inclined to exaggerate the importance of the president and underestimate the importance of Congress, as if the Constitution doesn't make it quite clear that Congress is really the more important branch of government. Right now, 
And I heard this from Paul Ryan's own mouth on Tuesday uh, before the president addressed a joint session of Congress. The initiative lies with the House of Representatives and the legislative agenda of the Republican leadership. Paul Ryan and Kevin McCarthy, uh, who's the majority leader. You have to understand how much of Trump's program is actually theirs. That Trump basically bought into uh, the House Republican agenda on tax reform as well as on deregulation from the moment he made his speech to the Economic Club of New York last year. The repealing and replacement of Obamacare is another part of that Republican agenda that Trump basically adopted. The thing to watch in the next 200 days is whether or not Ryan can deliver one of the most radical sweeps of new legislation since the 1980s. If he succeeds, then I think Trump will be the beneficiary. Because in my view, radical tax reform and deregulation will have significant economic payoffs and will surprise uh, the critics of the Trump presidency most unpleasantly. The third obstacle is, of course, the economy itself. What if you did all this and it didn't work? Because actually Larry Summers is like, right, and secular stagnation is a more powerful force than any reform you might possibly undertake. Remember, the Federal Reserve thinks that the US economy won't grow faster than at best 2.3% this year. That's far short of the numbers that Donald Trump is talking about. And by the way, the IMF thinks the same, and even Goldman Sachs is pretty pessimistic. So I think uh, we need to consider the possibility that this is not the 1980s, and even a Reaganite combination of tax reform and deregulation won't work. One reason it might not work is uh, right here in the Congressional Budget Office data on the debt. The United States is in a much less pleasant fiscal uh, situation than it was in uh, when Ronald Reagan uh, gave his inaugural in 1981. I would say nasty fiscal arithmetic is one of the biggest headaches the Trump administration is going to encounter. Barack Obama had record low interest rates throughout his time in office. That meant that the debt could go up, more or less double, without the uh, debt servicing costs going up in proportion. Those days are pretty much over. And one reason they're over is this lady, Janet Yellen, the Fed chair. I know we all think that the people at the Fed are great technocrats with degrees from MIT, but it's funny, isn't it, how they went from being incredibly dovish up until November the 8th, 2016, to being incredibly hawkish from about 3 a.m. on November the 9th. And yesterday, uh, it became even more apparent than before that the Fed intends this time for real to raise rates this year. That's a problem for Mr. Trump, especially if he's serious about a major infrastructure investment plan. I look forward to this tweet storm. It's going to be great fun. Trump v. Yellen. One final obstacle, and this comes back to the central point that Gideon was making. You know, free trade works. Protectionism doesn't. This has always been the problem with populists who pursue protectionist agendas. Isn't it amazing that we live in a world in which the President of the United States uses the word protection in his inaugural address, and the President of the People's Republic of China goes to Davos to the World Economic Forum and defends free trade? For me, that was the supreme moment of cognitive dissonance this year. No one will emerge as a winner in a trade war. Those were the words of Xi Jinping in a very cleverly calculated speech that went down tremendously well with the Germans in the audience. I heard that a member of the German government had to be restrained from giving him a standing ovation. I won't say who it was. <laughs> Playing hardball with China over trade, or for that matter over the South China Sea, as some of the president's advisors would like to do, and I include Steve Bannon in that group, is risky. It's economically risky. People always say that Goldman Sachs has great influence over the president, and they're right. Gary Cohen is his number one economic advisor. 
Every piece of research that Goldman has published since the election makes it clear that a trade war with China is a disaster for the United States as well as for China. And when you think about the geopolitical risks of going head to head with China, as the president seemed intent on doing when he took the call from the Taiwanese government, you see just what could go wrong. But I'm going to conclude with some good news. Everybody should read The Art of the Deal. You'll learn a lot about the president and his ghostwriter uh, from reading it. My style of deal-making is quite simple and straightforward. I aim very high, and then I just keep pushing and pushing and pushing to get what I'm after. That's what he does. That's why he opens aggressively on almost every issue, expecting at some point to have to step back in the negotiation. But the art of the deal is meeting its match in Washington, D.C., as we speak. Uh, of course, Kevin Spacey is a fictional uh, president in the House of Cards, a television series I highly recommend. Uh, but when the Spacey character says the president is like a lone tree in an empty field, he leans whichever way the wind is blowing, he's saying something profoundly true, and I think it applies to the Trump presidency in particular. Trump's fate is being decided this year in the House of Cards. That is the significance of the Ryan McCarthy legislative campaign I described to you. And finally, remember that China has its own art, not the art of the deal, but the art of war, which was written a little bit before the art of the deal. And I'll conclude with a quote, which I think illustrates why so very quickly President Trump accepted, after all, the one China policy, and why I think before the year is out, there will be a summit between Trump and Xi Jinping, and all talk of a trade war will be forgotten. It is said that if you know your enemies and know yourself, you will not be put at risk even in a hundred battles. If you only know yourself but not your opponent, you may win or may lose. If you know neither yourself nor your enemy, you will always endanger yourself. This is my recommended reading for the Trump administration. Thanks very much indeed.